There's a passage of scripture where Jesus invites some of his disciples to come with him across the lake in a boat. And while they are crossing the lake, a great huge storm whips up. The Sea of Galilee was very deep, and so when a storm hit, it could really hit and could really whip up, causing uh, absolute terror for those in a little fishing boat. And in this particular story, the amazing thing was that Jesus was asleep in the boat, and the disciples couldn't believe it, and uh, in desperation woke him up, saying, don't you know that we're perishing? We're about to die here, and here you are asleep. Well, in a way, as we enter into a time of prayer, it seems that that image, that story, is very much what we're about. We come into a time of prayer acknowledging that there's so much in life that we can't control. I think that's why we love talking about the weather. It's one of these things that we just can't control, and there's so much in our lives that is beyond our control. But the other thing that we do in prayer is we acknowledge and remember that Jesus is in our boat, that he's the one that called us to come on to the waters, and that he's there sleeping peacefully. We can call on our God and have that peace in the midst of the storm. But there's nothing wrong with waking up our God when we are in need and calling out and remembering whose we are. God will get us to the other side. So let us come in prayer before our God. Holy God, we praise you and give you thanks that you are our Savior that you are with us, though the mountains shake, though the seas roar and rise in our lives. Whatever is in our lives, whether it is springtime and sunshine, or whether it is times of difficulty, we come before you knowing that you love us and that you have promised to never leave us. God, we praise you for ways in which we participate in your love for your world. We praise you for, wit for ministries that make a difference, O oh God, that bring light to darkness, that bring hope to times and places of despair. God, especially we thank you for music, for it speaks to our hearts almost more than anything else. And so this day we ask a special blessing for Abe, our minister of music, for the members of our house band, and for our choir, for all the music that is in this church, for all of our voices. Oh God, we praise you, and we pray that you would fill our music with your music. Speak to us, oh God, in this ministry. God, we praise you and thank you for the ministry of our wider church. We thank you for the Mission and Service Fund, which makes a difference with the Stop Community Food Center in Toronto, which is more than just a food bank, oh God, but a place of choosing health, of learning and building community together. Holy God, we ask a special blessing in our community for our seniors' homes. We pray for Bridalwood Manor, for Sherwood Park Manor, for the Wedgwood, for St. Lawrence Lodge, for Rosedale Retirement Center, and, and for the retirement centers in, the, in surrounding communities. God, we pray for those who work there. We pray for those who volunteer there. We pray for those who live there. Especially, O oh God, we ask your blessing on those who don't want to be there. We pray that they would feel that you are with them, even in a place that doesn't quite feel like home. And we pray, O oh God, for, for those who help to make it a home. We ask your blessings, O oh God. 
Holy God, we have people in our church and in our community who have asked for prayer, who require a special blessing. And so we lift up to you Fred Wilson, Tina Redoubt, Marjorie Upman, Gord Ferguson, Ron Gardner, Vern Irish, Tom Burton, and Lisa Axworthy. We pray your healing. We pray your presence. We pray your life and light in their lives, O oh God. In a moment of silence, let us just bring before God others we know who have not been named, or let us bring ourselves before God for a blessing. is one more step along the world I go and this this is uh, also the uh, pre-offering song so just as a as a heads up for that if you would rise and sing with us one more step along the world I go one more step along the world Unfinished business. Our Christian lives. <laughs> I'm working on that one. All right.
clapping right. Um, our family just returned from a wonderful two-week vacation that we'd had to delay from earlier in the year due to family sickness, um, and I had a completely different sermon prepared for this morning, but one of the annoying things that you, an occupational um, hazards of being a minister is sometimes the Holy Spirit starts giving you ideas about a sermon even when you don't want them, and uh, these ideas kept coming through to me while we were on, on the... Uh, uh, a, a nice cruise together, and so on. We got back late Friday night, and I ended up dreaming about this sermon, and then having to spend most of Saturday preparing it. So, if you don't like it, blame the Holy Spirit, not me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, as I said, just uh, just over two weeks ago, uh, Debbie and my son Cameron and his girlfriend Kylie and I, we began our journey in the vibrant city of New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and the hotel that the cruise line booked us in uh, for the two nights prior to our cruise was the Hyatt Regency Hotel, which is an astonishing hotel. You can see the elevators, they go up like 30-something floors there, and it's all glass all around, and, and it's, uh, it's quite an amazing hotel. It's a spectacular hotel. But in 2005, this hotel was at the epicenter of the Category 5 Hurricane Katrina when it smashed into New Orleans with sustained winds of 280 kilometers an hour, causing the deaths of 1,833 people and over $108 billion in damage. And the hotel looked a lot different after that day. There was no glass left then, and it was just a complete disaster zone, and it actually took over six years for them to repair the hotel and for them to open it up again for public use. And every time you went up in one of the elevators, they had, you saw the inside elevators before, they also had elevators on the outside of the building, and every time you went up, um, oh, I, guess, I think there's one before, oh, must be missing a slide. Every time you go up, you'd see the, uh, the, the uh, Superdome right across the road, and I kept remembering all the pictures during um, Katrina of, of the, the terrible things that were happening and the people trying to take refuge in the, in the Superdome at that time. And you just, just couldn't you know, help but imagine the suffering that, that was happening to the people of New Orleans at that time. And yet the people of New Orleans were very adamant that they don't see themselves as victims. They definitely see themselves as survivors and they had a very clear belief and understanding that God was present during Katrina and in the time afterwards as well. They were very clear that it was an act of nature on a planet that's subject to Mother Nature's whims and forces, as well as the man-made challenges that uh, climate change and other things can bring into our environment. And they were very adamant that all the way through this process that God was with them during the storm and in the aftermath of its devastation. I always stop to think that we have two choices when tragedy strikes. We can either blame God and throw God off of our ship that we're traveling on and just uh, try and go along with things by ourselves, uh, or we can uh, ask God to come and sail with us on our cruise of life and to be with us and to get us through the storms and get us to the other side. We can also band together as people who... Uh, can bring strength to each other and help each other through a tough time, which is what, exactly what the people of New Orleans have been doing over the years. 
Our tour of the city took us through the lower ninth ward that was uh, the heaviest hit area of the city where the, pretty well the whole ward was underwater at the time. And a lot, of, a lot of the loss of life happened in that area. But this community has refused to die under the devastation. The survivors came together and they're con beginning to rebuild their city piece by piece. Some beautiful new community centers um, are coming up. Many of the famous musicians and celebrities who hail from New Orleans have been helping to rebuild the, computer, the, the community. And neighbors have been helping neighbors. These Habitat for Humanity houses are coming up, just rows and rows of them, where the occupants are helping to build their own houses with the help of uh, organizations like Habitat for Humanity and other organizations. And all of a sudden, these, these lovely neighborhoods where everybody knows each other are getting together to help. I couldn't help but think of the uh, passage from St. Paul when he, you know, he, he talks about... Uh, let us run with perseverance, the race marked for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, and of the, the faith of these people in this ward who have just joined together to rebuild their city one house at a time. After our uh, time in uh, a very stormy New Orleans ended, uh, we boarded the Norwegian Dawn cruise ship for our 12-day trip through the, the Caribbean to Boston. And there were amazing entertainers on board this ship. Um, one of them that I really liked a lot was an, uh, an older Irish folk singer and humorist who um, just kept us tremendously entertained. And he told a joke that was a church joke, and I just couldn't let it go. You know, I just couldn't do it. So he talks about uh, one day that uh, Father O'Malley in his parish in Ireland was uh, leading a Sunday school class. And dear old Father O'Malley, it was around Easter time, and he, and he says to the, to the children, the, the, the wee children um, in front of him, he said, says to them, uh, Now children, would any of you be knowing what the resurrection is? And there's just silence. And he says, Now you must know. Can any of you tell me, what was the resurrection all about? We got a little bit Scottish there, I'm sorry. <laughs> been doing too many accents lately. <laughs> and, uh, and there's silence, and all of a sudden, little Mary in the back puts up her hand. And he says, ah, Mary, to be sure, do you know the answer? And she says, well, Father, I'm not too sure about what the resurrection is, but I know if it lasts for more than four hours, you're supposed to get medical attention. <laughs> Uh, the things that come out in Sunday school, eh? <laughs> Certainly for us, the, the, the best thing that, uh, that happened on, on the cruise was uh, one night, under a starry night, on the aft deck of the ship, unbeknownst to Debbie and I, our son Cameron went up on the, on the deck with his uh, girlfriend of three years and uh, got down on his uh, one knee and proposed to Kylie, and she uh, um, said yes, and so uh, that was a pretty romantic day on the, uh, that's in Bourbon Street, which was a real eye-opener from kids from, from small towns, but anyway. So that, that, that was certainly a joyful time on the cruise. You know, I, I can't help but think that there, there are many differences and many similarities between going on a cruise in the ocean and the, the little, literal cruise of our, our life the passage that we take through life as, as people ch trying to follow Jesus. The most obvious difference between the two, of course, is when you're going on a literal cruise, you can choose where you want to go, right? You can pick the cruise you want to go on and where it goes to, etc. In life, of course, on our, our life cruise, we can't choose when we're going to be born. We can't choose where we're going to be born. We can't choose who we're going to be born to. We can't choose the socioeconomic uh, um, stratum that we are born into. We can't choose our gender. We can't choose our race. We can't choose our gender identity at birth. All of these things are things that we can't get a nice brochure and choose, although I guess some medical areas, they're working on some of those things. But 
the beginning of our, our life cruise is something we just can't choose. But there's many similarities between literal cruising and our, our life cruise as well. We can't choose who we're on the cruise ship with. That's something for all of you who have gone cruising before. You know, sometimes that can be a challenge. And in our lives, we can't choose the family that we're born into. And we can't choose um, the people that are at work with us, and that's we're the highest boss. And we can't choose the people who we're in church with either. You know, folks come from all different backgrounds and places. And I was really amazed by the example of, of the crew on the ship, because there were some pretty challenging people on the cruise that didn't always treat the crew very well. And yet, the crew were always polite, always uh, showing a real e example and trying to do everything that they could for the person, no matter how belligerent they might have been to them. They were an exa excellent example for those of us who claim to try and follow the, uh, the life and the path of Jesus. And when we're dealing with what we might call extra grace people, we need to ask God to help us to treat them with dignity and respect and patience as well. We also can't avoid storms on a literal cruise, and we can't avoid storms that come, of course, to us in our life with Jesus. When we left New Orleans and entered the Gulf, we hit a 10-hour megastorm that, um, I don't know if there was ever a break of about 5 or 10 seconds between lightning. It was a doozy, a real um, humdinger of a storm, you might say. Uh, fortunately, of course, the ship has all the modern navigational aids that are needed that even if they can't see anything in front of the ship, they know where they're going, they know what's in the way, and they know what's under them and around them, and, and have all those things to help them through the storm. Cruising with Jesus, of course, we have some of our own navigational aids. We have the Bible, we have the Holy Spirit, we have the example of Jesus, and we have good friends and fellow congregational members who use their life's wisdom to help to guide us on our journey, on our cruise through life as well. We all in our lives, I think, can try and live a healthy life. We can try to eat properly. A bit tougher when you're on a literal, literal cruise. Uh, <laughs> we can try to eat properly. We can exercise. But despite this, sometimes we still can't avoid the health challenges of life that come along, can we? On our uh, first day at sea, um, Debbie came down with an ear and sinus infection not the best combination to go with her post-concussion syndrome on a rocking ship. Um, I managed to pick up this nasty cold later, cold later in the trip, but these were annoying things, but we made the most of them, and rather minor, of course, compared to the big waves that we can face in life, the health waves that come along at times. In life, there are far more challenging illnesses that can come along and rock our crews violently as we're going through them an unexpected diagnosis, a chronic physical or mental health illness, a loved one who's suffering. At times it can feel like the waves of life are 40 feet high and we're desperately in need of a lifeline to save us. It's in those times that we need to hang on to that lifeline that is Jesus and let him carry us through that storm. Sometimes that will take us to a place of physical healing, Sometimes it will pull us through the daily physical or mental health challenges that we have to face on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes it may mean God calling us home to be with him in a place where there is no more suffering. We really don't know during these times of life, but we do know that Jesus is there along the journey. The security on the Norwegian cruise ships is provided uh, almost predominantly by the men and now a, a couple of women from the uh, region of Nepal where the, all the Gurkha rifles come from. Any of you who have done any military service or that will know of the legendary Gurkha rifles that serve in both the, in the Nepalese army and the British army and in the Indian army. They're uh, warriors that are legendary warriors. Their pride, their courage, and their faithfulness are indeed legendary. Um, a week ago yesterday, of course, the terrible storm of life came and occurred in the mountains of Nepal when that devastating 7.9 earthquake claimed over 7,000 lives, injured over 14,000 more, and there are still 
thousands missing at this time. You know, whenever our life cruise is rocked by one of these natural disasters, we just naturally want to ask God why. You know, why do these things have to happen in our life? And the answer to that question is a very complicated one. I certainly can't answer it either adequately from a geological perspective or from a theological perspective. For me, it's a question that's on my list of questions for God that for when we meet face to face. What I do believe, however, is that God will act in the midst of this tragedy as God acts in the midst of the tragedies that have happened throughout our life and in the years before. I do believe that God works in disasters to change people's lives. We can see that in New Orleans. We've seen it elsewhere as well. Over the coming days, we'll hear how people's lives were changed because of this disaster. Just like after Katrina or the tsunamis in Japan and Thailand, we'll hear about miracles. Even this morning, I was checking one of the news feeds, and they found a 101-year-old man still alive eight days after the earthquake. Natural disasters, we know, are no respecter of status. We know that the CEO of one of the largest companies died on Everest during the um, earthquake. The poor Sherpas in the region also died as well. The earthquake showed no quarter or no respecter of our status in life. But we are seeing how nations around the world are pouring out their hearts and their resources and love and compassion to the people of Nepal. People of all faith traditions are answering the call to bring God's hope, comfort, and peace to a hurting nation. And God does this by fulfilling the promise that he made to us in Romans 8.28, when he says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God doesn't say that the things that happen are good. God says that in these terrible things that happen, God will work and bring hope. We've all seen examples of people who have gone through similar things that have happened to them in life and yet have responded in different ways. One person may have become bitter, run away from God, throw God off the ship, so to speak. And yet having gone through something almost identical, another person may run to God and ask God to be on their ship and to get them through, give them the strength and the hope that they need to do that. God's ultimate answer to this question of why there are natural disasters is not an explanation. It's an incarnation. Jesus Christ. You see, I can never love a God who's distant, disinterested, detached, and watching our suffering from afar. I could not l love a God that doesn't care about those who lost their lives and their families in these last weeks. But I cannot help but love a God who says, I will enter into your suffering. I will enter into your pain. I will come into your world and I will suffer a death on a cross to let you know how great my love is for you. I can't help but love a God who has promised us an eternity where there will be no suffering. In our cruise of life, there will be calm waters and there will be stormy waters. And it's crucial to invite Jesus into the ship with us. When Cory Tam Boom was in a concentration camp, she wrote the words that no matter how deep our darkness, God's love is deeper still. No matter how deep our darkness, God's love is deeper still. When these natural disasters happen, when the storms of life happen to us, don't run from God. Don't run from the open arms that are waiting to give you hope, strength, comfort. God didn't cause the storm, but God's waiting in the middle of the storm to throw you a lifeline. Let's pray. <coughs> Gracious, loving God, we do know that even as we sit here this morning, that there are those within this room who are going through a tumultuous time where the waves seem so high, where the coming over the side of the boat. There's days when we might think that we're sinking. There's days where we can't see ahead of ourselves and can't see the 
light at the end of the storm. There's days when it, sometimes it might feel that we're the only one in the boat. And there's days, Lord, when we don't understand, when we see great suffering around our world. There's no easy answers. And Lord, I know that our viewpoint on all these things may be minor compared to yours. But we ask that, despite that, that you will give us peace amidst the storms. That you will give us hope amidst the storms. We thank you for examples that are there in Scripture and in life around us to show that there are, miracles do happen in storms, that hope happens. We see people in this very building who, at one time, we weren't sure if they'd be here with us. But we also know that there are others that you have chosen to call home to be with you. And Lord, we... Uh, Sometimes don't like your answers. Sometimes we don't like your timetable. Sometimes we uh, get angry with you. And that is because we do believe that you are our heavenly parent. And when we're kids in trouble, we need our parent. And so, Lord, just this day, for anyone here this morning who is just really going through a tough time, we just lift them up to you, Lord. Fill them and give them the strength and help to ease the waves and help them to know that you are in the boat with them. And Lord, we give you thanks for the times in our lives when we've gone through the storms and come out the other side and normally we're stronger. And help us to use those experiences to bring hope to others. So Lord, be with us now. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will walk. Please rise and sing. I will. I will walk.
gently on your head, refreshing your soul. With the sweetness of little flowers newly blooming, may the strength of the winds of heaven bless you, carrying the rain to wash your spirit clean, sparkling after in the sunlight. May the blessing of God's earth be on you as you walk the roads. May you always have a kind word for those you meet. And may you always cruise with Christ. Amen. Let's join hands and sing. Go now in peace. Oh, we start with the choir and then we join in. <laughs> 